Welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network, coming to you from the TeacherCast studios since 2011. Join us each week as we bring you the latest educational news, ed tech updates, and hottest interviews with today's most influential leaders in education. And now, for your host, Jeff Bradbury. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you for joining us and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. This is Digital Learning Today, episode number 22. Today, we're not only going to be talking about the upcoming ISTE conference, but we are going to be talking about artificial intelligence from an inclusive point of view and how we can actually use some of the accessibility features with AI. This is a topic that has not been discussed, and I'm so excited to have a fantastic guest on the show today with me. I want to welcome today, Miss Kim Zajac. Kim, how are you today? Welcome to TeacherCast. Well, thank you, Jeff. I'm doing well. Um, I'm excited to be here and uh, excited about the topic that we're going to be talking about. I am excited to have this as a topic. We've, of course, been talking about artificial intelligence from the coach's point of view, the teacher's point of view, the administrator's point of view, the district's point of view, the parent's point of view. <gasps> And all of that stuff is going to be archived over on teachercast.net slash podcast. Check it out. I've even got a special AI page that has not only all of our AI podcasts, but all the blog posts, et cetera, on there. Check out all the archives over at teachercast.net today. And of course, don't forget to hit like and subscribe on that podcast. Kim, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you and what do you have yourself doing these days? Sure. So I work in Norton, Massachusetts, which is a suburb south of Boston. And my role here in the Norton Public Schools is speech and language pathologist at the Norton Middle School. Um, I work with a variety of students with uh, different learning profiles and strengths and areas of challenge and uh, continued growth. I work in classrooms. I work with students in separate settings. And we have, try to have fun and be creative with the work we have to do uh, in the time that we have together. Now, I am excited because you and I are going to be heading to Denver in a few weeks, uh, heading out to ISTE. Are you looking forward to ISTE like everybody else seems to be these days? So I really can't wait for ISTE. ISTE is one of my very favorite um, events of the year. It brings me together with so many wonderful people um, through you know that I know in the ed tech world. Um, I am never have been to Denver. So it's both uh, an exciting thing for me professionally to get to the conference and also geographically to explore another part of the country. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I am uh, presenting a couple of different times, um, which, you know, is always extra special because it means that you get to share the work you do with people from all over the country and, and sometimes even other countries. Um, so I don't know if you're interested in hearing about that, but I could share on that. Well, I noticed that you and I both have a playground session on Monday. And for those who are, are going to be ISTE newbies this year, a playground is essentially a large, I, I don't know the professional way of saying, holding pen full of educators. And there's <laughs> going to be a bunch of stations and basically you just walk. It's like a big petting zoo, essentially, right? It uh, is a very friendly petting zoo. Yes, except there's, yeah, it's mostly looking. <laughs> Although no, some no. hands-on activities. <laughs> but, but they're wonderful because they're all at the same time. And you can basically go from playground session to playground session and you know like i'm, I'm gonna be there on monday from 12 to 2 before the instructional coaches one but you've got one called base camp for creatives what is that yes so that is the playground that i am helping to organize and run along with jackie Gardy, manuel herrera dan Ryder, and matt winters and it is a playground happening in playground a in the bluebird ballroom from three to five on Monday. Uh, and it is, is essentially what you just described. It's, it's a bunch of creative stations where we have presenters from, again, around the country, but also we have some presenters from uh, Belgium and Mexico and possibly even Russia coming to share their best practices and what they're doing with their students and learners to expand creative capacity um, in the interest of critical thinking and um, problem solving and working to achieve more collaborative, inclusive outcomes um, based on a number of perspectives and including the use of educational technology in the process. So it's a lot about 
this is what we've done. This is the innovative path we went. These are the tools we used. Here's what's worked. Here's what didn't work. And that's OK. Um, and to invite people to try things uh, in their own learning environment, to bring things back to where they do their work with students that are immediately actionable. Um, and to your point, Playgrounds are, again, one of my favorite places to spend time when I'm at ISTE because it's very conversational. Um, the approach is very casual, yet highly informative, with a very high impact um, that revolves from the conversations and the questions and answers that can be shared. Uh, and many times there are spin-off conversations and spin-off connections that continue to grow beyond the time that we're at the conference. And so um, definitely stop by the, the creative um, base camp for Creatives Playground if you have time. And again, that's gonna be Monday, June 24th from three to five. And the best thing I love about these playgrounds is that it is a two hour block. And you know, for many sessions, it's oh, if you're not there on time, you don't get in or you gotta wait or, you miss the good stuff. But with a playground, you can show up at 4.30 and get the same exact experience that somebody shows up at 3.15 and gets. And it's all just a matter of having that one-to-one -one access. I mean, imagine being able to have one-to-one -one questions with the presenter. That's what a playground is. It's so special. And it brings people together that maybe wouldn't otherwise cross paths or have conversations together. Um, we have a special aspect to our uh base camp for creatives this year, which is our a Lego persona project, mm. where each person who comes to visit will design, um, you know, a version of themselves represented, you know, by different accessories and so forth, and find their place in a geographical layout of the state of Colorado. And so looking at the, the map that we have, they'll decide, you know, sort of what feels like their Colorado match or home or most comfortable place and, uh, you know, locate themselves there. And so at the end of the two hours, we will have a representation of the different people that came to visit us and what, you know, they find uh, appealing about Colorado. And then that um, that um, creation will actually spend time and live beyond the walls of the crate playground in the camp creativity um, installation, which will be uh, throughout the conference itself. That sounds like a fantastic thing. I tell you what, when I'm finished with our instructional coaches one, I'm sticking around and playing with Lego. Right? That, Who doesn't love good Lego fun? Of course. Absolutely. Now, if you're going to be out in Denver, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to meet you. We'd love to get in touch with you. I'm going to be looking forward to flying out on Saturday morning, I believe, uh, spending some time at the affiliates meeting. There's a lot of great stuff happening these days. Um, we're going to be putting out an entire blog post and podcast series all about ISTE coming up. So, again, check out those things. And, uh, you know, let's just do this in the, in the beginning of the show here. Kim, where do people reach out and how can they follow you if that way they want to, you know, get some questions answered before ISTE? Sure. So I, you know, you can find me on the Twitter sphere or better known as X nowadays. My handle there is at Zajac SLP. Um, and I also have a LinkedIn profile where you can find me. Um, and uh, I'm also on Instagram as well at Kim Zajac SLP. Um, so I, I welcome questions, uh, people to touch base ahead of time. That would be so great. Um, and then I love to meet people that I've talked with uh, online in person at ISTE as well. Lots of coffees have been shared, um, yep. just dishing over, you know, the projects people have been doing and and conversations that have, have found their ways uh, across across the airways. One of the things that I love about ISTE is that you have a chance to check out different topics, but from different point of views. And that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to have you on the show today, because artificial intelligence and accessibility, I know these things go hand in hand, but rarely do I see that in the Twitters, in the X spheres, right? Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about this. What are some of the things that are out there these days? And what do you see right now is possible for teachers, school districts who are trying to support exceptional learners? Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential out there. Uh, a lot of features of AI have been around and available for quite a long time. We just didn't categorically refer to them as such. Uh, things like Google Read and Write and text to speech and speech to text and um, features like that have been around for a while. People use um, Alexa and Google Home for getting information. So we've 
we've had things available, we just haven't necessarily thought of them with at such a broad scope. Um, in terms of what's available, there is a lot available right now, and I think a lot being used for the educators. Um, and there is on the horizon starting to have a rollout of student facing AI opportunities as well. Um, and what's sort of in the at the crossroads of that, I think, is guidance and education around using the tools ethically, responsibly, and safely um, because the work we do in education does involve uh, students and students, you know, who are not uh, adults yet. Their um, their privacy needs to be thought of for them and protected um, very intentionally. So um, there's a lot of possibility um, and healthy skepticism, I think, is also a part of that conversation. So that, again, we sort of are walking a line of um, taking uh, new directions and trying new things to um, empower learners, all learners, to break down barriers, to create access points, but while doing so, um, not um, forgetting about the things that matter most, which is the student safety and um, also making sure that these tools are uh, increasing their skill development um, and not acting as replacements. That's um, oftentimes a, a situation of fear where um, people might think, well, if we use AI, won't that be taking away all the work? Won't that be making it too easy? And the answer is actually no. Um, by using artificial intelligence and using uh, tools that are available, we can break down um, we can break down situations or uh, workflow that in the past may have been um, requiring modifications by another person, a teacher, an educator, in order to make it adaptable to a student, whereas the AI can actually empower a student to look at what the work is ahead of them and through a scaffolded approach, um, break down some of the questions um, that need to be answered in order to complete the work that's in front of them. So, um, and then teachers can use the same. Um, teachers can use tools. I mean, I have a few favorites of my my own, but I mean, Magic School, I can't say enough about Magic School. It provides educators with an opportunity to um, really differentiate their uh, material and content in a way that can reach all the learners in the room. Um, and that's, you know, through tools like a, uh, they, there are so many magic school tools, but text leveling, um, translation tools, um, you know, there's ways that you can um, even use magic school for writing an IEP uh, to help you decide what skill you're going to work on and how you're going to approach that and what, um, what measuring system will be used in order to look at what the progress is with a particular skill. Um, so I just I can't say enough about that particular school and what it does for not only the teachers, but the learners themselves. Well, let's break down some of these things here, because there's a lot of questions that have been popping up uh, over the last few weeks in our discussions, both on our instructional coaches Facebook group and also on LinkedIn. When we're looking at accessibility, I know that most teachers are not familiar with the accessibility features that students have built in, right? Um, I know myself, I'm, I, I go up to work with a student, I see the mouse is different, a screen is backwards, a, you know, whatever these things happens to be, there's not a lot of PD training out there for teachers on basic accessibility features. And now just even starting this conversation today, I'm now nervous that I need to be worrying about AI in accessibility features. How can a teacher start to figure these things out? Is it really just a matter of pushing buttons on a Chromebook or on a laptop? Or are there places that we can go, uh, blogs that we can follow, YouTube channels? Um, how can I start to make sure that I am fully aware of all the things that are available so that way in case I'm ever asked about a student, I can help and provide the right answers? That's a great question. And the answer kind of varies widely. I kind of come back first to sort of the ethical um, considerations. And so one great resource for that is teachai.org. Um, there are all kinds of great uh, nuggets of guidance and um, suggestions for teachers to really educate on what is AI, what does it mean, um, how is this information used, and what are the safest channels in which to use it. Um, and what kind of best practices should be put in place. In terms of specific platforms and um, devices, I find that each 
platform or device will have its own sort of PD um, library that is really important for educators to dive into. And it sometimes can take some time to discover. Um, but again, coming back to social media is very helpful. Um, professional learning network, maybe in your own school or in your own town or city that you can connect with. ISTE itself is a great resource. There's uh, the ISTE, um, there's a, co a community sort of uh, portal now that has many different topics and, and areas. And I believe equity and inclusion is one of them. Um, I myself this year just got a clear touch panel, uh, mm. which is absolutely amazing and life changing in in terms of um, accessibility and inclusivity. Uh, but there's an entire host of accessibility features that I'm about to pull back the curtain on this week, and it's through Clear Touch PD. Um, so it's just finding the right places within the tools that you maybe already have in your hands and diving deeper to see what kind of um, webinars might be available, what kind of blogs are available, and you know, also attending any kind of PD that might be available to you locally or, you know, or at a distance, depending on what your interests are or what your um, budget might be. We are making sure that all of the links that are discussed today are going to be in our show notes. Of course, this is Digital Learning Today podcast episode number 22. Um, now, Kim, once we have all these skills available, how do you keep track of all this stuff? You know, we talk a lot about organization. There is a, an onion that, you know, we, we talk about peeling back the onion, but the onion is still growing every single time. I feel like every time we start a podcast, there's more layers to, to un unravel here. How do you keep t track of all of the tools, all the skills? What's mm. your organizational method for all this? I, I use Google. I, I keep track. I keep um, documents. I keep things organized in my um, Google Drive, really. Um, you know, I label things by tool, by, you know, by platform, and just kind of keep track of what tips and um, you know, user cases that, that there are. Um, I use strategies like creating um, tabs at the top of my Chrome uh, browser. That helps me keep things organized, so I, it's just a click away. Um, and creating shortcuts, that also helps me to know where to go, where to click for what reminders I need to have. And then as far as my work with student goes, students go, um, you know, again, I'm back to using Google. Google Forms are a great way to keep organized notes on students that populate into a spreadsheet. Um, and you can use information even, you know, in the work I do um, in my role as a speech and language pathologist, you can gather data in relationship to an IEP goal, and then you can take the data and you can use it um, to help you formulate something like a progress report note um, to summarize what was the, you know, what was the pattern over the past 12 weeks of, um, you know, student output uh, with a specific goal and what were the factors leaning into the successes or the, you know, the rate of progress that we saw. Um, so I, I like to use, again, I go back to Magic School for, for those reasons. They have a wonderful IEP generator tool that helps you to move through some of that work. And you mentioned Magic School twice now, mm -hmm. but when you say things like IEP generator, mm -hmm. If I'm saying this right, and please correct me, an IEP is a contract. Are we really putting contract creating in the hands of AI? And no. Much. No. <laughs> right, I, am I wrong to be worrying about that? Because that, that's not the podcast you're talking. That's the parent of three IEPs talking. Like, right. So it's I a tool. That somebody's going to be going to AI and making my kids individual academic plan? Like, like, no, it's the, it's the human who's still in charge of creating right. things, right? So... The Magic School IEP generator, that tool, is not meant to replace the human being, the person with the credentials who is, you know, doing the work with a student. Um, but it can help to lighten the lift of putting together language, the prompt right? The power of the prompt is what's important. You have to inform the AI tool of what you're trying to do and what the considerations are to be um, included in that process of the output that might be created. And then it again falls on the responsibility of the human being using the tool, just like it's our responsibility when we take the keys of a car and use those as the input to the tool known as the car, and we're driving it, we have to be responsible for all the actions and all the decisions that we make while we, were, we are using this resource. So 
You can put in information in the prompt to guide the output, you know, naturally because, you know, we're following responsible practices. No identifying information would go into the AI. There's no names, there's no birthdays, there's no nothing identifiable that would go in there. And yet we can get an output that can kind of help us think about how do I want to say this? What are the, the wordings of the goals that I want to include in this IEP? And there's a lot of editing that needs to and should be done. It should not just be taken hot off the press of the AI tool and just plugged into an IEP. That is not what any AI tool is intended to do, whether for an adult, a teacher, or a learner. When I think of accessibility and I think of inclusion and, you know, the work that you're, that I know you're doing at school as a, uh, you know, uh, language, audio, you know, mm -hmm. I would imagine that a lot of your work has to do with communicating back and forth to parents. Yes. What have you done or what ha what have your research done as far as supporting parent parent needs parent communications through artificial intelligence i mean have you gotten into where you're talking to parents about how this works and the, some of the tools has, has there been any questions um not about the magic school that we were just talking about but i mean i i see i'm having a hard time with this coming from the podcast my, my 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 dad hat is still on with all of this right like yeah. i want to learn how i can use ai to help my student yes these are all great conversations are they happening yet i don't think so i think that there's still a little bit of a cricket effect in education or at least in the area where i am mm -hmm. um i think in other parts of the country ai is being talked about a lot more and there's a lot more actioning happening with it um but I think that there are important conversations that will absolutely be, be coming down the pike and um, are important to be had because, again, it comes down to educate, right, um, to inform people of how to use tools responsibly for positive good outcomes. Any tool, whether it's a car key or a pencil or a steak knife, all have potential to be used in positive ways and in ways that can be harmful. Um, and so we just need to kind of understand that AI is really no different than that. Um, and it starts with educating people and having conversations about what AI is and is not and what the um, the th safeguards are that need to be put in place and followed and respected. And to really uh, hammer home that idea of I AI doesn't replace the humans. It's meant to be a support, a scaffold, a piece of the process that is melded and sort of worked through by the human at the center of it all um, for the best product on the outcome side um if that does that help answer your question it, it does and, and i don't you know look if, if people out there listening are in this same boat please let me know that i'm not alone i and just just hearing this conversation here you know i i think talking about ai as a podcaster i can hold my own um talking about ai in the middle school that i work at i'm an expert talking about ai as a parent i feel clueless and i've no I, I don't think in the i mean i've been thinking about this recently i don't think in the last 13 years there's ever been a topic where it's just so scatterbrained because there's so much to talk about and so many and it's not like oh here's the flipped classroom okay i can understand that here is you know uh, minecraft I, I can understand that mm -hmm. but i've got questions from about all of this from the PD person's point of view, from the coach's point of view, from the, I'd like to have a good conversation about this point of view, but then also the, yeah, there's the data effect in here, right? And and, yeah. and being a dad who works with their special ed department and works with the pathology, like all of those things, I, I got questions about that. Where do you go for your professional learning? Are there other... I don't want to support groups, but I mean, like, where, where, where do you go um, to... to talk to others yeah so uh, i mean it's sort of everywhere um you know probably you know are, i was lucky out there i mean is there uh well there, there are i mean there's a lot of people out there um you know online in linkedin there's a lot of good resources again i go back to teachai.org. that's a great um 
you know, well-researched, um, solid resource for anybody to look to for guidance and to, to better understand AI and what it is. It's also backed by ISTE and a number of other um, well-known organizations. So things are properly vetted and supported. Uh, and that's, I think, important to know that the resources you're looking to, you know, hold that backing. Um, you know, ISTE itself is a great resource to go to. I recently attended the ASU GSV um, AIR show, which is the AI revolution show and also the summit. Um, and both of those were tremendous resources for um, AI in particular, the AIR show itself. Um, there were lots of um, educators there. There were a lot of exhibitors there, vendors, startup companies, and the conversations were, were very rich. Um, there's a cohort of us uh, known as the Classroom AI Innovators that were identified and, and did some speaking at that event. And so um, we'll be, you know, communicating outward to the universe through social channels um, throughout the year with discoveries and, and important information that, you know, is, is thought to be important to land in the hands of educators um, as well as parents, um, because you bring up a good point. You know, we, we need to look at AI from many different perspectives, the, the user being the teacher and or the student as well as parents. And it reminds me of the conversation that, you know, happened back when, you know, using technology Technology in schools was becoming much more prevalent when one to becoming a one-to-one -one district was sort of a new thing. And so digital citizenship, right? It was this big new idea. Well, really being a good digital citizen is the same as just being a good citizen, right? And so, uh, but it's in a different environment. Um, and there was a lot of talk on whether there should be digital citizenship uh, classes and things of that nature. And so, so I hear similar questions being raised with this concept of artificial intelligence. And um, it's quite similar in that AI, it's not really a separate thing. It's a thing that's going to be part of what we already do. And so it will become embedded. It will become sort of integrated into the scene. And uh, over time, everyone's comfort and um ability to understand how it is and to know how to use it will improve. And I think also that the developers are going to become better at what, you know, they're putting out there. Um, at ASU GSV Summit, Ethan Mollick said, this is the worst AI we're ever going to have to contend with. And, and I thought, well, that's it. 100% true. We are just at the beginning of this journey. And there are so many questions. There are far more questions there than there are answers. Well, let's change the question here for a second here because one of the things that we've been trying to figure out here on our channel is how can we use artificial intelligence to make the work easier to lighten the load mm -hmm. and there's a number of ways to do that uh I, you know I, i've been working on my book and people are giving me comments and changes and things like that and it, you know when i started writing the book it was oh now I have to rewrite a sentence. No, I have to rewrite a paragraph. But now I can click a little button and it gives me five different ways to say the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm at that point where I can feel good about myself because I, it's still my writing. They yeah. just move the words around. And, I, and I, when I first started writing the book, I didn't use any AI because I was thinking, that's not my writing. But the more that these things are starting to go into, it's like, no, it, it, it took my sentence and it just made it a little bit easier. And it gave you ideas, right? It gave you ideas and it gave you a metacognitive, multiple, right, perspectives to consider. Um, and it, it showed you models of the way language can be used in different ways to communicate the same message. And then you ultimately, as you just said, have the choice over what is the final you know, decision. And it may be a combination of what one of the suggestions is, plus your own words, right? That's oftentimes what it comes to be, because we still, you know, we still want what we put out there to be representative of us as, as the creative human. And that is another thing I wanted to say about AI is that it really, it breaks down barriers through creativity, right? Mm -hmm. So it provides multiple possible models to look at and modify that otherwise would not be there for contemplation, right? And that can be in text, but it can also be in visual form. A lot of my students um, who might have challenges in the area of language learning, language processing, um, language formulation, um, they really enjoy using AI to generate 
uh, visual outcomes, visual products. And then they can more easily talk about what the meaning behind the creation is that is a better representation maybe of what they understand about the content or the topic at hand. When we're looking at using it for organization, when we're looking for using it as productivity tools, I'm constantly asking myself, what don't I want to be doing? Or what could get done quicker? One mm -hmm. of the things that I use AI on constantly, and this is through Magic School AI, is building my rubrics. You yes. Know, I say, I'm doing this project. This is what I'm going to do. It's a five-point scale. Can you spit me out something? Mm -hmm. And from there, I just go copy and paste into Classroom. And, and I think that's a wonderful way to not only start to get your feet wet, uh, it's a way that I've started to work with other teachers and other coaches. Let's just find one thing, because let's be honest, if you're listening to this, Magic School AI is fantastic. It has 75 different things to it, right? It's it's a little overwhelming. So if it's getting into it through the the uh, the IEP tools, great. If it's through the rubric tools, great. If it's through something else, lesson plan organizer, great. One but of my favorites is the social story generator. Hmm, tell so me about it is wonderful. So oftentimes um, there are some students who um, do, uh, uh, you know, have a better time in, within their learning environment when they are made aware of a change that might be coming up, a field trip, a, a special performance, an assembly, a holiday celebration. Um, and writing those can take some time because usually those stories are individualized and on level with the student who would be receiving them or, or having them read to them aloud. And um, Magic School AI can take that lift and lighten it immediately. It's all through the input that you give it. Create a social story for a sixth grader with a language learning disability and cognitive disability where the expectations for the upcoming drama performance are explained and take into consideration that lunch will happen at a different time, that we will be sitting with our class, and that bathroom breaks will happen before and after. And it will create a beautiful social story that you can then, just as you explained, take, you know, extract it, export it into a Google Doc, and you can add some visuals using Google Images, and there you have a social story that might have, in the past, taken an hour to create, is now only taking 20 minutes, or even less. That is a great solution to, I think, so many of our problems. I mean, I'm just hearing you say that, I'm going, wow, that's a great thing for, like, you know, dinner time conversation. Absolutely. And it, so that's something a parent could benefit from, right? So social stories and uh, explaining changes in routine, it benefits so many kids. Um, and having a tool that makes that easier and less time consuming is a win for everybody involved. If you're looking for more information, check out all of the stuff over on our show notes here. Again, this is Digital Learning Today, episode 22. I'm taking a ton of great notes, lots of links to everything. Uh, Kim, I, I, you know, I, there's so much stuff on here, and I know we had talked about doing a follow-up with this. I think sometime after ISTE, we're going to get a lot of the guests from our AI shows. I just want to do like a big AI roundtable of all this stuff. If you'd like to be included in that, please feel free to reach out over at teachercast.net. You can head on over to teachercast.net slash contact. Would love to have you guys on a future episode to talk about AI or anything that's interesting you uh, over the summertime, especially going into the next school year. Ooh, I said next school year, didn't I? I'm so sorry. <laughs> We're way too, too early to be talking about the next school year. Too soon. Major hashtag too soon. Uh, uh, Kim, I, I want to wrap up with one thing here. What is your recommendation for this summertime? Some people are going to ISTE. Some people are not. Some people are interested in AI. Some people are just, just trying to figure out what that first step is. Mm -hmm. So let me put you on the spot here. What is that first step? I think the first step is deciding what your interests lie in, why, they lie there and then deciding what type of content you would like to use to, you know, to, to achieve your goals. So it might be that reading a book is 
something that feels enjoyable and manageable and that you will get a lot of benefit from, I would say go in that direction. If it's more that listening while you're at the beach or while you're running or doing the other things that you enjoy doing in your summertime, then maybe it's a podcast. Or maybe if you're more of a, a visual learner, then maybe it's looking at some little micro bites, some, um, you know, some short videos that will be just enough for you to consume bite-sized pieces of information and, and knowledge around AI, let it sink, and then create some questions for yourself and, and go forward with trying some of it. Um, so I think it's really up to the individual. I think, you know, it's a natural place this summer for a lot of educators to have questions or um, to be able to identify maybe one or two or three um, areas of interest specific to AI and think about the, what their process, you know, what natural process would feel right to them. Because we really just want to make sure that whatever it is that is consumed and learned sticks. We can build, always build upward. It just has to feel comfortable and, and doable. I, I still love that quote you said. This is the worst that it'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was Ethan Mullick's quote, and he was right. Uh, Kim, one more time, where can somebody reach out and find out more about the great things that you're doing? Yes, so I can be found on Twitter, otherwise known as X, at, at Zajac SLP, or on Instagram at, at Kim Zajac SLP. Also on LinkedIn, um, Kim Zajac. We will make sure that we have links to all of Kim's social media, her website, all that great stuff over on our website. Again, this is... Digital Learning Today, episode number 22. But don't let that fool you. This is actually about episode number 300 and something out of all of our great TeacherCast podcast episodes. So check out everything over in our archives over at teachercast.net forward slash podcast today. That's teachercast.net forward slash podcast. And you'll check out not only Digital Learning Today, but Ask the Tech Coach and our Jeff Bradbury show, which we would love to have you guys become a guest on soon. And that wraps up this episode of Digital Learning Today. On behalf of Kim and everybody here on TeacherCast, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you guys to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. You've been listening to the TeacherCast Educational Network, hosted by Jeff Bradbury. Please reach out to the show with all of your questions on Twitter at TeacherCast or online at www.teachercast.net. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please take a moment to write a review in the App Store.